and usually when you meet people the first time, you haven't seen them for a while, the conversation's going to go, so what do you do? What have you been up to? I said, right, well, I'm a fundraiser and I work for hospice. Oh, that must be so hard. Well, yeah, it is. You know, the targets are immense. I work really long hours. It's pretty stressful. No, 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 no. It must be really sad. People die in the hospital. It's like, no, shit, Sherlock. Yeah, they do. But no, it is not sad. I love what I do. I love working in a hospice. I look forward to going to work every day. I get a real kick out of what I do. I go home feeling like I've really done something really positive. I actually enjoy working in a hospital. And I thought about that a bit more and I thought, I actually enjoy death. <laughs> I thought that's really black. Do I really enjoy death? Well, I'm surrounded by it all day. I talk about it. I listen to people talk about it. I write about it. I read about it. I raise money because of it. I raise money to keep a hospice going where people are going to come and die. And I love what I do. So I must love death. Not in the literal sense. I thought, no, 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 that just makes me a little bit odd, a little bit weird. What I love is what the hospice has taught me about living and there are some things particularly for me it's taught me about living in a moment really really relishing life in a moment because until we die we are alive we are living let's live every moment of it and focus on that moment and I truly take that across my life and I see it every single day now before I worked at St Wilfrid's which is fabulous I actually worked in a children's hospice, and that's an even bigger, oh. <laughs> but that's where I learned it, because if you're going to learn about living in a moment, work with kids that are dying, because they really know how to do it. Now every year at this children's hospice, we have a children's Christmas party, nothing flash, village hall, village hall, Santa, we've tinseled the shit out of this place, it's everywhere. <laughs> We've got fake snow, which is mini polystyrene balls. We did that once because actually, let me tell you, polystyrene balls don't work well with the tracking. <laughs> so we have a slightly bigger polystyrene for the year on. But we've got Christmas going on mega style. And we have the most amazing time. The kids, any kid at Christmas, is magical. And this is magic. Now you've got a choice. You can stand in that party dressed as a fairy, as I oft was, <laughs> and you can think, oh, bloody hell, half these kids aren't going to be here next year. This is their last Christmas. That's the reality of the children's hospitals. Or you can go, I'm in, bring it on, let's enjoy Christmas and make the most of that moment. And it is spectacularly joyful. And you live for right now. And then the next Christmas, you do the same again. You unpack the tinsel, you bring on the fairy, you bring out Santa Claus, and you go again. And it's just as magical every single time. But it is a moment in time. And it is an absolute joy. So I have learnt to live in a moment and enjoy living. The other thing I've learned is that I actually quite enjoy grief. I'm not an emotional sadist, I'm really not. Grief can be pretty crushingly awful. But one of my really, really, truly favourite things when I'm at work is if I get a call down to come, say, take a donation from someone. Um, an old gent came in a couple of weeks ago to hand in a donation from his wife's funeral. And off I trotted and I sat down with him and we sat down at a table, got a cup of tea. And he looked so lost and so sad. And I said to myself, how long are we married? Nearly 60 years. Mm. What was her name? We'll call her Betty. 
and then I can remember Betty. And I asked him a couple of questions. And then he was off. There was tears, there were tears, there were tears. But he told me about their life, the nearly 60 years they were married, their children, the way they travelled around Europe in a camper van for five years, much to the disgust of their children. Her cakes were extraordinary, apple pie to die for, he used to grow too many apples in the garden. He adored this woman and he talked at me for an hour and he came alive almost. I'm sure you've seen that as a doula. But somebody who is grieving, if they talk about people, it almost seems to lift them. But what I feel, what I get from that, the privilege of that is that I almost feel I know the person who's died. They come alive for me and I've shared that and it's such an extraordinary privilege to meet people like that, to hear about people who've died but still they live on in a memory. And there was something about him when he'd gone, he was just slightly lifted. And that just makes me smile every time it happens. Even today, literally today, I had a friend who died in the hospice only a few months ago. Um, and today, 30 of her work colleagues walked from Bexhill to Eastbourne to celebrate her life, to raise money for the hospice and just to sort of say thank you. And I got to go down, I met her family downstairs, she brought the dog in that I knew was Lisa's, you know, Lisa's dog and her friends and we had an hour where we talked about Lisa and we laughed about Lisa and we remembered Lisa in such an amazing way. It was such a celebration and it was just that moment, you could be sad where you could say what an extraordinary woman she was, how well she was loved. And I take that with me and it lifts me. I enjoy that part of what I do. It doesn't make me sad. Every day is like that in that hospice. And that's what I take from that. Now, what I actually do is fundraising. And so, my world of fundraising very often collides with the world of the bereaved. They come and they say, right, I want to do something really positive today. I need to do something to remember somebody, to make sense of this loss, to fulfil a dream, to celebrate a life. They're all such positive things when people come to me. I get to hear about the person who died, the person they loved. We laugh. We smile, we joke, we plan. We plan extraordinary things. I've had people who want to run 10 marathons in a year, jump out of a plane, cycle to Paris, shave their head. Strange things, home, away, small things, big things. I am with them from the moment they come to me to the time they fulfill this dream of theirs, this passion, this challenge. And all of those things are so life-affirming. They are joyful, they're passionate, they're celebratory, they're loving, they're respectful, they are positive. They are such fantastic things, such an amazing energy to sort of take away with you every day and think, wow, these people are amazing, what they do is amazing. The people that died are amazing. We can remember them in so many fantastic ways. And being a fundraiser, and events manager as I have been for many, many years. Working in hospice has also allowed me to do some incredibly ridiculous things and mad things. I've dressed <coughs> up as a bear, as a clown, as a cow, as a fairy, as a duck, as a snowman, as a reindeer, and a giant M&M. <laughs> don't need to ask me about a giant M&M. But even, again, that's sort of moment, Thing. I was dressed as a duck, just, I did, I just had a thing with a duck costume, and I was at the children's hospice at the time, and it was an open day, so I'm jumping about being a duck, and <laughs> generally the hospice was empty at that point for an open day, but we had one child in who was right at the end of life, so couldn't go home, and the family agreed that we could carry on with the open day, so 
this child was kind of aware of what was going on. And as I'm leaping around dressed as a ridiculous looking duck, it wasn't very convincing either. I got a little knock on the window of this particular bedroom and it was the nurse sort of saying, can you come in, can you come in? I'm like, whoa, okay. And uh, this kid had spotted me leaping about outside and wanted to meet the duck. So bear in mind, see, this child was literally right at the end of his life and still he was tickled pink by this ridiculous thing that was cavorting about outside. So in I went into his bedroom and I spent a few minutes trying to be a duck and we had a lovely chat and he was the most gorgeous little boy and off I went again. Again, just that moment, you can go in and be incredibly sad about it or you can think, oh my goodness, you know, I made that kid smile just right at the end. Just had that little connection with somebody and it really matters and it means so much and you take it on and you take it forward and it changes the whole of your life. Now just to sort of finish off, really, I thought I would share some of the more ridiculous things that being in the hospice has given me the privilege of experiencing. That will tell you why it's really not sad working in a hospice. I have, at various times during my hospice career, I've been chased by a hippo. <laughs> I have carried Countess Mountbatten's handbag up a flight of steps while steadying her from behind so she didn't fall backwards. I have been escorted from the top deck of HMS Victory because I shouldn't have been there. I have driven a car into a ditch in Bedbury Forest while planning a bike ride. <laughs> oh yeah, there's some dark things. I have stopped traffic on the Arc de Triomphe in a white transit van so that 100 cyclists can go past. I am the reason the French don't want us in the EU. <laughs> and my personal favourite, and the highlight so far, I have seen McFly in their underwear. That. And that's why it's a great fun job working out. <laughs>